sound recording. Hello everyone, welcome to another video on dialectics. Today we're going to be looking at lecture two from this book. If you haven't already, please check out lecture one, which is already out on this channel. In an introduction to dialectics, Adorno starts lecture two with an overview of lecture one. He writes that on the one hand, the dialectic is a method of thinking, on the other hand, it is an attempt to do justice to some determination, quality or feature of the matter in question. Here I think he's referring to how the dialectic can be both a method and something that is not fixed. So whilst it is a method of thinking, it justifiably interprets a thing without letting that thing get caught up in preconceived ideas about what the thing should be. It allows you to critically interpret the thing and critically interpret your own way of thinking about a thing, I think. So critical awareness. Critical thinking. Yeah, that'll do. The movement of the concept. Adorno explains that the movement of the concept describes what happens with our concepts when we think. I'm sure I've said that before. Fascinating. Anyway, this suggests a process, something in motion. So therefore it seems absurd to fix static definitions on things when the act of thinking is supposed to be dynamic. Also, the notion of concept is not straightforward. According to Adorno, it can be viewed from varying angles, and this alters what it is in some ways. I'll explain. Or, or Adorno will explain, to be fair. Adorno writes that concept has just this double sense. On the one hand, it is the concept which we bring to things. That is to say, the methodically practised manner in which we grasp the relevant conceptual moments. Yet, on the other hand, it is also the life of the matter itself. On the one hand, we are talking about a procedure of thought which can be learned, while on the other hand, we are also talking about something which unfolds in the thing itself. What I get from this is that the concept is the concept in contrast to the thing. With the thing? Contrast with? Contrast to? But it is also the method used to comprehend the thing, by way of a continuous hermeneutic loop between concept and thing, as I explained in my last video. In other words, concept is this process of critical comprehension of a thing, but it is also the essence of the thing itself. That is, this process of critical comprehension is all we know about the thing, and therefore is the thing's essence. How can we know it to be anything else? I think the point is not to get caught up with the idea that things, because they're physically outside your head, are therefore distinct from how we perceive them, because they're not. We have to think, well, do we perceive them as such because our preconceived ideas about things influences the way we see them in the first place? It's like, what comes first? The thing or the concept? <laughs> and I think Adorno's saying, there isn't a separation between the two, really, because that in itself is a preconceived notion, isn't it? There is more. There is a hermeneutic loop between the object and our perception, or concept about that object. And this hermeneutic loop is also the concept of the object in question. This is how concept can be both the iterative relationship between concept and thing, and also the concept within that iterative relationship. As Adorno says in that earlier quote on page four, concept has this double sense. I think, to put this simply, he's saying a thing's concept should be that dialectical process that goes on in order to understand the thing's concept. Basically, you have a concept, you have the thing, but this relationship between the concept and the thing is also the thing itself. Concept should never be stationary. It should be this critical comprehension that changes and adapts in relation to the thing and one's concept about the thing. I think the point is to just be critically aware of this. Of course, discussing this is very difficult to do because we have words and words have orders. The whole thing is a confusing f***ing mess. The point is, I think, I've got a hair in my eye. Oh, f the point is that this is all supposed to be self-evident. It's just the way things are in the world. We just don't think about them like this. Well, maybe we should take this and use it to really understand the world. Ah, uh, there we go. Okay, so concept should never be stationary, it should be this critical comprehension that changes and adapts in relation to the thing and one's concept about the thing, but also in relation to time and a broader context. Time and place also has an influence on how we would critically approach a thing. We know this, we just don't think about it in these terms. Dialectic, method and concept and thing. Adorno explains that dialectic is both the method for comprehending the thing and the contradictions within the thing itself. He writes that we might really be dealing with the possibility that the word dialectic is being used now to describe a particular method of thought, a particular way of presenting something, and something quite different, namely the kind of oppositions which unfold within the thing itself. This latter cannot be regarded either merely as a method, 
or merely as a way of identifying oppositions which are empirically discovered in things themselves, but then the dialectic would fail to reveal that compulsion, that power of the whole. A dialectical philosophy must be one which posits thought and being as identical. What I gather from this is that the dialectic describes a method of thought that allows you to critically comprehend a thing, and in doing so, by way of a hermeneutic relationship between concept and thing, you unravel all the contradictions inherent in the thing, and inherent in your concept about the thing. Concept and thing are intrinsically linked, remember. So you unravel all the contradictions inherent in the thing and your concept about the thing. However, it is this dialectical process, this continuous critique between the thing and your concept about the thing, that is the dialectic also. The dialectic is these oppositions that unfold, as well as being a method of comprehending these things, within which oppositions are unfolding. Having said this, you can't then simply treat the dialectic as a method for revealing these oppositions and fixing it as something separate from the thing itself, because that's not dialectical. Rather, you have to be aware that thought and being are one and the same. It's an ongoing, ever-changing process. Constantly becoming, I think. I think that's what he's saying. The concept about the thing is not the thing. Adorno reminds us that what we think about the thing isn't identical with the thing itself. So, just like I said that the thing, we can't comprehend it absolutely, it's always going to be coming from our own mind, because to perceive the thing is naturally to be perceiving it. We have to be aware that what we think about the thing isn't necessarily the thing itself. We don't know what it's like outside of our head, but then again, to comprehend it as such is not dialectical, I think, because concept and thing are not so separate, disparate, they're intrinsically linked as one, and to think of the thing as being something separate wouldn't be dialectical. <laughs> Adorno keeps mentioning this, I think he keeps apologising, you've got to explain it somehow, and this is a starting point, to just be aware of it. Just be aware that they're not so disparate. But we also must remember that what we think of the thing isn't identical with it. And we know this, people have different interpretations of everything. Things seem different to different people, and we have to be aware that the thing and the thought about the thing are not identical. I think that's what he means. Surely that's what he means. Um, so Adonna reminds us that what we think about the thing isn't identical with the thing itself. He writes, While everything is indeed to be taken up into thought, thought must also be acknowledged as something which nonetheless differs from its object in every instant. Okay, so we have to think, or at least be aware, that our thought and the thing are not the same thing, are not the same entity. Well, they're just not. We know this. Okay, basically, we do not know what the thing is, it is only our perception about the thing that we know. That's all we can know. This next section is Hegel oppositions and not oppositions. So just as a brief recap before we go on to Hegel oppositions and oppositions, we have sort of, to summarise, the concept and the thing are intrinsically linked so that they are not so disparate after all. There's a dialectical relationship and this dialectical method of thinking reveals oppositions which are intrinsic in the thing and concept about the thing, presumably, and this dialectic is the essence of the thing itself. However, we also must remember that thoughts and the thing are separate things and thoughts about the thing <laughs> are not the thing itself. So this sounds like a contradiction to me, but I don't think it is. I think the two do work and I think this is the essence of a dialectic, isn't it? Because you have these contradictions that actually do work together. The dialectic is the intrinsic relationship between concept and thing, but also concept and thing. Yes, no, yeah, I had it for a minute. So you do you, you thing. <sighs> Your concept about the thing and the thing itself are intrinsically linked, because they have to be. You can only perceive the thing according to what you know about the thing. Having said this, we must remember that the thing is not our assumptions about the thing. We mustn't just assume that our thoughts about the thing are identical with the thing itself. We could be wrong. Don't be assumptive. Ah, oh, yeah, that. See how they both work? Right, now we can move on. <sighs> Page six. On the one hand, the dialectic is precisely what endeavours to express the opposition between subject and object. The opposition of matter and method the opposition of cognition and the infinite absolute. On the other hand, the dialectic is supposed to posit all this as one after all, and thereby expunge this opposition from the world. In relation to this, he talks about the Hegelian way. He says, it produces and is this identity precisely as the totality, as the entire range of all the developed individual contradictions. Here he's saying, with Hegel, these contradictions are unified in a way and become this unified thing that is the totality. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and I think Adorno's dialectics are different th from this because he says that the whole of, of truth should be about the inherent contradictions. A moment ago I pointed out that contradiction didn't I, that the concept and thing are intrinsically linked but at the same time separate from each other. 
those are contradictions that work together and it's not like they have to be unified into something greater they don't the contradictions just work i think i'm getting this okay carrying on with my notes now my hair is a mess it's all part of the process Basically nothing in this process is fixed. Not even the notion that there is a process. Uh -huh. This video is gonna be a total nightmare to edit. I just will not shut up. Um, Adorno writes, everything that is must actually be comprehended as something in movement, as something that becomes. That's crucial, I think. We have to think about things not as just something that is or is being, but something that is becoming constantly. Everything is becoming. That's easy to get behind that. Yeah, I think the crucial point here is to think of things not as beings, but as becomings. Everything is in a state of continuous imminent critique and therefore always becoming. Now we're onto this time and history thing that I mentioned. Time and context, okay. This may seem self-evident, but the notion of becoming suggests something temporal. Adorno explains how time and history must be taken into consideration when thinking dialectically. He writes that time is not only a necessary form of our intuition, it also provides the ultimate condition for the capacity to connect our thoughts. Nothing can be thought by us unless it can be thought as something essentially temporal. Okay we think in relation to time. It's how we manage our day and our existence. Naturally, we think temporally. Can we think not temporally? I guess it's quicker in your head, things are. Mm. Well, I'm a composer, that's all temporal. I do see the piece more as a non-temporal thing in my head, but my comprehension of the piece would change over time because I'm essentially a human being living in a world governed by time. My existence is governed by time. Um, anyway. Thinking temporally suggests this motion. Things are not stationary. So, in addition to there being a continuous imminent critique between concept and thing, there's also a temporal aspect. Things become in relation to time. Adorno also writes that this idea of the fundamentally historical and dynamic character of experience thus leads dialectical thought to maintain that particular essences cannot in fact be grasped in rigid terms, but must be conceived as something which changes through history. Again, this seems straightforward. Concepts and things can't be fixed because time changes and history changes and something in the past won't mean the same thing to people today. It shouldn't do in theory. Well, it doesn't. Thinking that it does is where we would misunderstand thing and that would be where we wouldn't be critically thinking about the thing. Concept and thing would not be in an imminent critique with each other. That is where we'd be falling back on preconceived ideas about things and essentially not grasping the thing at all, I think. Basically, we have to be aware of this and be critical in our interpretations. Don't fall prey to dogma and preconceived ideas. Think for yourself and constantly engage in this imminent critique between concept and thing. Be aware that you only know what you think you know. There are no objective others outside the mind because we perceive, <laughs> because we perceive even that notion via the mind. It, this reminds me of the way I used to <laughs> explain why investigating consciousness was kind of impossible to do because you're using consciousness to research it and the way I described it uh, like years ago it's kind of like trying to write on a pencil with the same pencil and that's what this is like to me if that helps anybody you're welcome reification and hypostasis Adorno explains further how concepts should not be fixed and reused without a critical awareness of that concept and corresponding thing in relation to its wider temporal context where it sits in history basically just don't fix anything he writes that dialectical thought does not claim that truth is eternal or remains identical to itself but endorses a concept of truth which has taken historical determinations up into itself the phrase up into itself always i don't know if it amuses me or what is like i've already said you can't just take a concept that was widespread in the past and apply it today without an awareness of how that concept came to be within its historical context. Adorno writes that if dialectic wishes to grasp the philosophical concept from which it lives, then it must concretely attempt to reveal the historical meanings of objects which it addresses. You have to take into consideration the historical 
context. Things to us would have meant something different to people in the past and that's just what we have to be aware of. You might think the penny farthing is weird and totally inconvenient, but back then they didn't have, I don't know, aeroplanes. Adorno writes that what appeared to traditional thought to be absolutely stable and secure, to be a fixed and ahistorical self-identical truth, now itself appears as a distorted historical image, namely as an expression of petrified relations which seek to perpetuate themselves, the very nature of which is to perpetuate themselves, and which have now basically lost a living relationship to the subject, which are reified, to use a crucial term from this philosophy. This is a hypostasis, where some finite finished thing is made into an absolute and falsely posited as the ultimate ground, as if it were the truth in itself. The struggle against the reification of the world, against conventionalisation of the world, where what is ossified or frozen, where something which has arisen historically now appears as if it were something simply given in itself, something binding on us once and for all, this is what furnishes the polemical starting point for all dialectical thinking. So there you have it. Here Donna is saying that once you establish a concept and separate it from its historical context, it is reified. He also said at the beginning of that quote, concepts from the past that seemed like self-evident truth just seem out of context now. Well they are, they are out of context. A reified concept cannot withstand dialectical thinking. You would unravel it. It may appear as an absolutely stable, secure concept. It's not a stable, secure concept when you critique it. This false stasis is not truth, and I think when you critically think through it with imminent critique dialectically, the contradictions reveal themselves and the things should just fall apart. All this to say that truth cannot be fixed. And you can't take something that was formed in one historical context and expect it to be applied without issue to another historical context. It must adapt according to context and an imminent critique between the concept and the thing. This is why dialectical thinking is important, because it is needed to struggle against the reification of... well, just reification, generally. The thing that's reified is just taken to be fixed and given. The concepts are just there. I don't know. I've just banged my hand. Okay, so basically this reification is something that arises historically but is taken to be fixed. And we mustn't fall into this trap. Basically, think critically always. Don't mindlessly follow preconceived ideas. Nothing is fixed. Having said this, don't fall into the trap that reification can be countered by another principle. Bear in mind that everything fixed is reified. That would include principles. So Adorno writes that dialectical thinking must not try and counter this reification by appeal to some principle or other to another abstract or, if you like, equally reified principle, such as life, for example. To grasp a thing should really mean to grasp the historical necessity of a thing in all its stages, basically. As well as a continuous imminent critique between concept and thing, there's also a temporal unstasis. Time and truth. Last point of the video. So all this is to say that time exists in truth. Adorno explains this here. The standard conception sees truth as something essentially timeless, as that which remains absolutely self-identical. On the traditional view, truth does indeed stand in time, is marked by a certain temporal index, is somehow affected by time, and it is on account of this temporal dimension that we are never really in a position to attain the full and absolute truth. But the idea of truth, from the time of Plato through to Kant, has always been identified with the idea of that which is eternally and absolutely binding. Now, the truly decisive challenge of dialectic lies not in the thought that truth must be sought within time or in opposition to time, but rather in the idea that truth itself possesses a temporal core, or, as we might even say, that time exists in truth. So, without dialectical thinking, you might see truth as a fixed notion that isn't affected by its time or its place in history. Adorno says truth is not fixed. It's changing, and this temporal aspect needs to be acknowledged. So to put this simply, the truth of anything is influenced by time. And again, I think he's just wanting you to think about it. And you know, thinking about it does sort of open up new perspectives on life that I find beneficial. I, I, just, I just, yeah, if you have a, I think it's worth thinking about. <sighs> Sorry. Um. <laughs> So what were the main takeaway points from this lecture then? In lecture two of An Introduction to Dialectics, Adorno talks about the movement of the concept. 
concept, where concept is both the method used to comprehend the thing, but also through an iterative process of comprehension between concept and thing, is the essence of the thing itself. All that is must be comprehended as something in movement, as something that becomes. In addition to this, or because of this, time affects the meanings of things, and the things themselves, I suppose, because concept and thing are intrinsically linked, as well as the thing not being identical with thought about the thing, <laughs> or thought in general. Yes, things and thought are different. Adorno writes that truth is affected by time, and because of this, we are never really in a position to attain the full and absolute truth. Because time is constantly changing. It's like when you look at a particle that's in motion, the particle is stationary and it becomes a particle, but when you look at it in motion it becomes a wave. And because time is constantly moving, each discrete moment does not exist because time is constantly moving. Even if you go minute, minutely down and down and down and down, and down, time is constantly moving. So we're never in a position to really concretely assess the thing because time exists so we're constantly becoming. That's what he means. Oh please, I hope that I've conveyed that to you. Such an enlightenment moment, again. I just need a moment. In short, truth is not static. Because life isn't static, time isn't static. Dialectical thought sees the idea, the notion of an idea, as constantly changing, both temporally and in the process of comprehension. Oh, I wasn't even recording. Ah. Oh, what? In short, truth is not static. Dialectical thought sees the idea as constantly changing, both temporally and in the process of comprehension of a thing or imminent critique between the concept and thing in a single moment. But does a single moment exist? Probably not, because as we've already established, time is more like a wave, constantly becoming and moving, and to pinpoint a fixed moment and essentially reify it or make it a concept would be like pinpointing a particle and once time has moved on, or once you've actually pinpointed that particle and defined it, preconceived idea it, it is no more, because time moves on. It's like he said, you cannot really attain the full, absolute truth. We're not in a position to do so. Everything is constantly becoming, so we have to constantly critique the thing as we flow like waves. So that was Adorno's lecture two. Stay tuned for the next video in this series for lecture three. So, thank you. I'll shut up now. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.